So um, it becomes very difficult to, to put together, you, and you guys just don't understand this, one day many of you will, to put together an introduction. How do you introduce the words you're going to speak? It's hard, right? It's difficult. So I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, I sat down uh, and I carefully crafted out a statement that could properly introduce where we were going today or be, introduce where we were going today. So I crafted out a statement. And so I want you to, to, to grab a hold of this um, and, and, and don't forget it. Remember it as we go through um, the rest of this morning. So this is basically my statement um, and it goes, if you can't see, it goes like this. It goes, in the realm of contemporary Christian discourse, there frequently surfaces an unwitting predilection for terminological profligacy, whereas adherents in their exegetical engagements manifest in ineffable inclination towards gratuitous deployment of obfuscating ecclesiastical nomenclature. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I nailed it. It's almost like I don't need to speak anymore. Um, so I, I nailed it. So that was basically where I was going um, this morning. So please um, stay with me. It just gets worse from here on in, guys. Um, so that's basically where I was, you know, was going. And, and, and for those of you, there may be some children left in the room. Um, I can um, shorten that maybe just by saying basically that as Christians, we tend to use words we don't fully understand. That's where we end up, isn't it? That's basically what we do. And this is one of those things which I'm sure bothers nobody in this room right now except me. But it kills me. It pains me. And it hurts me. It hurts me to realize that very often words in a biblical context change to words in contemporary contexts. And we see it, I can give you an, an example. When I was in college, um, I was reading up, and, and some of you may know, but there's a couple of famous German scholars, Kyle and Dulwich, and they wrote this 10 volume commentary, which probably none of you are gonna read. But, but they wrote this commentary, and inside this commentary, they sit down and they write about the Holocaust. They write about the Holocaust. Now, to you, you guys are looking at me like a big deal. It is a big deal, because they're writing about the Holocaust in the early 1900s. They're writing about the Holocaust in the early 1900s simply because the word Holocaust means whole burnt offering. It had a meaning before what took place in World War II. And so an ancient word changes in meaning and it's wrapped in an entirely different package than we use it today. And that really made me think a little more about words and how we use them. And we see this in the church today. We, the same thing happens. Words were used in a biblical context. And they change nuance in the way in which they're used today. And we see this with a ton of words. And this... And this and it bothers me, and I'm sorry, it bothers me. We see this word love. Love in Deuteronomy 6 means something very different to the way we use it today, either in the church or outside of the church. Love in Deuteronomy 6 has a much higher uh, impetus to uh, obey and to work and to serve. Today, it's this wonderful feeling that we have. And to love someone means that you have to agree and affirm with everything, everything they say and they do, even if it's evil. We're loving when we say, yeah, that's okay, that's good. That's what love has morphed into, into meaning today. I don't want to talk about love. I do want to talk about one of these words which has done that, and that is this word, faith. It's the word faith. The word faith has changed meaning from the biblical days to our contemporary situation and very much the way that we use it in church. And I just want us to be very 
uh, aware of that because that's really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about not just the, the word and how it's changed meaning, but also I want to mention uh, what it means for us and how we interpret our lives with this uh, adjustment on how we understand the word. I can't, and I wish I could, I can't look at every single aspect of the word faith. Our time is limited, unfortunately, unless you guys give me the green light to go on as long as I want. Um, um, so um, I, I want to begin um, unpacking this word of faith and what it actually um, uh, means and how we, pr how we properly understand it. Um, so to begin that, to do that, I want to look at a short passage from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, I love the book of Hebrews. Um, you must know why I love the book of Hebrews, because it quotes, it cites the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament, so it's got to be pretty cool, right? That's where I land. So I love the book of Hebrews. It cites many instances from, the, from what we call the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, um, but it also uses those to glorify the work of Christ and who he is and how Christ, his, his birth, life, death and resurrection reflects everything that God was, was doing in the Old Testament through the book of Leviticus uh, and Deuteronomy particularly. So it shows this wonderful um, fulfillment of, of, of scripture. And I say fulfillment because unless you, you, you have to really grasp what, was God, what God was doing in, in the book of, um, the, of, of Leviticus to fully understand what's going on in the book of Hebrews. So it's a very, very um, important book and I like it a lot. And so that's where I've chosen to begin from. The passage that I'm going to be speaking from is something that's called the Faith Hall of Fame. And it's a passage, a wonderful passage in which um, the, the author of Hebrews cites all of these people who have gone before, who have exhibited faith in their lives. And they are to be um, lauded and praised and set as examples for us. So we're going to read from Hebrews um, chapter 11 verses 1 to 12, and I'm, I'm going to need some help with this, um, obviously, from the people upstairs. Um, sorry, uh, throw that back. Good. Um, so, let me begin by this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go, called to, go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as a foreign, in a foreign land, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven 
and as many as the innumerable grains of sand on the seashore. Hallelujah. Let me just pray. Father, as we open up your word, Lord, we need your guidance and wisdom and understanding, Father, to, to properly soak it in and to understand it and to make it, to make it meaningful to our lives, Lord. And I pray for a, a, a special dispensation of your Spirit's power upon me and upon everybody here as we hear your words, Lord, that they may indeed uh, be life-changing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so that is the passage that we're looking at, and we're looking at these, these stories in history of examples of faith. History is the greatest teacher, um, I believe. Uh, and even it goes on, um, chapter 11. If you haven't read this part of Hebrews, chapter 11 and 12, please go home and do it, because it is really inspiring stuff. Speaking of the heroes of old, I like superhero movies, so this type of thing is really, really cool for me. But you go home and read um, Hebrews 11 and 12, um, just, to, just to finish off what I have begun today. Um, this passage begins, interestingly enough, speaking about God. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Cool. Um, it talks about what faith is. Um, today, in this day and age, we don't know we're born in this day and age, but for us today, intellect is king. Intellect rules. Um, back in the Semitic mind, in the ancient days, in olden times, it was not so much about um, the intellect and what you knew, it was about what you did. And that is really, really, really a big deal. As we understand the world today, this is what faith looks like. I believe in Jesus. It's in a thought bubble. And it's an idea that's in our minds. And there are, um, and I, I speak, unfortunately, against there are, it, like many of the reformed type churches uh, understand the, the size of your faith as how much you understand theology and can explain theology, how much you can understand redemption, how much you can understand atonement. And that is the measure of your faith and exists in the mind. And that's very much a product of our, of this generation of, of, the, um, of the enlightenment. Um, and the thinking also comes down to us. It comes down to us as evangelicals, as charismatics as well. Uh, and our, the idea of our faith is something that sits in our minds. That's our faith. Now, if we take the meaning of the word faith and we go all the way back to biblical days, they will look at us as though we are crazy because that is not how they saw faith. Even though they may use similar words, they may use pistis, they may use emuna, something like that to describe it, the, the concept is very, very different. For them, if you say that you believe in Jesus, it means that because you believe in Jesus, you have been moved into some kind of action. You are moved to do something as a response of what takes place in your mind. And all together, this is faith. This is faith. You believe, you are convicted, you are moved, and there is some kind of evidence in your life that you have believed. This is biblical faith. It's a combination of a belief together with a positive reflection of that belief in a Christ-like behavioral change. That's a much simpler expression which you can digest. But this is pretty much faith, that reflection of what we believe, the evidence, something has to be shown about what we believe. I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. If you are, if you call yourself a Christian, it doesn't mean you agree with the beautiful plan that God had for salvation. It doesn't mean you say, yeah, God, that was good. It doesn't mean you say, oh, yeah, I accept that, Lord. It means that your life is changed and your life is transformed and is being transformed on a daily basis. This 
is what being a Christian is. This is what our faith is about. We can't say, we can't talk about life-changing faith. That doesn't make any sense because all faith is life-changing. So we can just say faith and that's all I'm going to do for the time being. Beautiful explanation we find here in Hebrews. It says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. This is amazing. First of all, we have to accept that by faith because none of us was there. So we, we kind of got to accept it by faith. But think about what he's doing and how he's beginning. He's beginning by talking about how God made the universe. God made the universe um, by creating something that was not there. There was no matter and he created matter. And that is exactly what faith is. It is a visible action when, there was no, when you can see nothing. I can't see somebody's faith unless they do something to show it. In the same way, God, we see what God was doing. He, he took nothing and he made it into something. And that transition from nothing to something is exactly the essence of faith. Our belief to our practical actions. And that's why he begins right here with this wonderful, um, that wonderful expression talking about the creation, going all the way back to the creation. And then he goes on, he goes and he speaks of Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, still speaks. Uh, the story of Cain and Abel, a uh, nice story to read, very difficult to understand, um, once you, you get into it, because the biggest mystery is, why was Abel's sacrifice accepted and Cain's not so much? Big issue. I don't have anything that can uh, answer it finally once and for all. Uh, but we can perhaps look at Leviticus 5.11, which speaks of um, two offerings. If a man can't offer two turtle doves or two pigeons then he needs to offer an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. The more expensive offering was the animal sacrifice. If you can't afford that, then you go down to the produce of the ground. And it could have been that Abel's sacrifice was more valuable because it was a living creature. It was alive. It cost more. And the more value, the greater your sacrifice the greater your faith. I'm going to say that. The greater your sacrifice, the greater your faith. And I'm not just talking about financial, I'm talking about time, energy, I'm talking about career paths. The more you sacrifice, when you grasp heaven, when you grasp eternity, when you grasp that, then you are willing to let go of so much more in this earth. You're just willing to let it go because you understand that you are here for a ridiculously short amount of time and that you are indeed storing up treasures in heaven. The measure of our sacrifice reflects the measure of our faith. So, Abel's offering was better, it was greater, and it was more acceptable by God, and he offers it by faith. We then turn to Enoch, another hero of the faith. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He wasn't found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Again, without faith, not a belief, but the actions that come, for, come from it. Without that, it's impossible to please God. Without faith... Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Enoch was taken up by faith. He's one of the individuals in scripture who does not die. If you haven't read about him, wonderful short excerpt we see in Genesis chapter 5, 21 to 24. But he doesn't die, he's taken up. And here we've got this idea about his behavior pleasing God. And we don't actually hear anything in his behavior in the book of Genesis. I don't know if you've read it. Um, however, let me just push us. I don't want to. I don't want to tip you over the academic uh, cliff over here. But I'm going to edge us a little bit closer. 
I'm going to edge just a little bit closer because we know the New Testament authors um, very often were not using Hebrew text, they were using a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Greek translation of the Old Testament. Why is that important to anything at all? It's important because if we take a quick peek at the Greek um, Old Testament, in this passage in Genesis 5, 21, 24, it says, Enoch pleased God and was translated, being an example of repentance. And I just think, wow, that's really nice. That's really, really nice. It kind of explains it for me um, as to how his behavior was commended as being righteous and, and why his behavior, his acts, were being uh, rewarded by God so that he did not even have to taste death. And then the story moves on to Noah, another test case by Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Noah is underappreciated by all of you, okay? You just don't appreciate him. Noah was a dude, man. Noah was, Noah was that guy. You, and you've got to think about it. Put yourself in the situation. You come out your prayer room, walk in the morning, go downstairs. You come out your prayer room. With God in your prayer room, God tells you, I'm going to send a flood on the earth, build an ark, save mankind. That's a tough sell to the wife. That's a really tough sell. Emma, going to be busy for a while. That's how I'd begin. That's how I'd begin. But it's a tough sell. You've got to think about how long this takes. You know, I'm going to be, okay. Natan, come help me in the garden. Help me with these trees. This took months to build. He's building for months. He's taking down trees. Look at your neighbor. David, what are you doing? Building an ark. Great. What's an ark? It's like a big boat that floats. Great. Expecting rain? Yeah, a lot of rain. I'm building this, and when I build it, all of the animals are going to come to me, two by two, all unclean animals, seven of all clean animals. They're going to get in here and we're going to be saved. How does that work with your neighbors? Not once or twice, daily, you get up doing it. You face ridicule. You're building this thing. You've got to be thinking, I really hope this works. And you've got to start thinking how stupid you look if nothing happens. Months this takes to build, every day, building this ark until the rain comes. That is a hero of faith, or faithfulness. Not a one-time act, but constant, constant behavior through doubts and everything else. He had his eyes fixed on something bigger, on much bigger. And then we get to Abraham and Sarah. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive his inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. You know, Abraham, go on a journey. Where am I going? I don't know. You'll know when you get there. He's just, just going to walk. He doesn't know where he's going. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise. As in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of him with the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This is Abraham. Some of you know, but some of you don't know what it's like to move to a foreign country where they speak a foreign language and you have to start from scratch. 
you don't know anything about it. What happens when you first see snow in a foreign land, when you go from, from, from Iraq to Egypt and you first see snow and you don't know what, what on earth is going on and you have to live with that? That takes faith. That takes faith. Abraham was ready, as we can see slightly from this picture here, to sacrifice this child of promise as well. That takes faith. Trusting that God's going to do it. Not just trusting, but doing something about it that God was going to intervene. Not only is Abraham commended, but Sarah is commended. And Sarah, another one, underrated. Huge faith. She's 90 years old and is told she's going to have a child. It was not an immaculate conception. Work with me, Faith Assembly of God. <laughs> Think that through. That takes faith. That takes faith doing something because God said it was true. Doing something as a response because he said it was true. In each of these accounts that is mentioned, we find the faith action. We find a belief. We find God speaking to somebody and them not holding it in, but doing something and responding and having their lives changed as a result to what God had spoken. This is faith. And the example I didn't mention, obviously, is the example of Jesus who lives this amazing life of faith as the Word of God. Jesus is both the object of our faith. He's the object of our faith because through what he did, we get righteousness imparted onto us. So in that sense, it works. He's the object of our faith, but he's also an example for our faith. He's an example that we need to look to. The way he lived his life is the way that we need to live ours. We have to copy him because he is the living word of God. And so where do we go with this? Obviously, if I'm talking about application, I have to begin to talk about things we can do, right? Make it a little bit more applicable to, applicable to us. And so I want to go, just, uh, just to finish, just with three areas of faith that we need to be aware of. I want, us, I want us to be aware of how faith is reflected in our lives. I want to talk about how we deal with doubts and the relationship between doubts and fears. And I want to talk about how we actually grow our faith. Those are three things I want to actually talk about. Is somebody, um, somebody's messing with me right now, um, but it's all good. Let me talk about our reflections of faith. How do we reflect faith in our lives? And you're going to look up there and you're going to see a kite. Don't start thinking, oh, David's gone soft, because he hasn't. The kite is there on purpose. Because the kite shows us something about our faith and how it's reflected in our lives. The kite flies highest when the wind against it is strongest. And this is how we find, this is how we begin to detect faith in our lives. Did you notice in all of the stories that we see in the book of Hebrews that I mentioned and even beyond that, each of the people that are lauded for their faith go through adversity. That's where it shows. That's where it begins. We get, we get confused about this. I know we do. We tend to think sometimes, you know, you reach the end of the year, your kids are in Harvard Law School, um, you know, you've just bought a bigger house, you just got a pay rise, your Great Danes just sired five Great Dane puppies that you can keep and bring home. You can, you, you can, um, 
you're coming to church, you're walking to church, and that's just your song. And, yeah, and everything is good, and you get hit with the Spirit, and you think, yeah, my faith is big. That's how it feels. No, it's not. It's not. You feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. Give thanks and praise for that. You feel good. You feel great. Appreciate those times. But that's not your faith. That's not measuring your faith. That's not measuring your faith. Your faith comes when you are ready to, 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 to throw it in, to quit. That's when your faith begins. When you're faced with a problem, not just any problem, a long-term problem, something that you've been dealing with for years, that's when your faith kicks in. We've been praying for unsaved members of our family for years. Years! Every Friday night, Emma and I, we pray unsaved members. At least for 25, 26 years we've been praying. That is an expression of faith. It's an expression of faith because it's been going on for so darn long. But we know we are speaking to a God who hears. We know we're speaking to a God who can act. We know we're speaking to a God who can perform great miracles. That is faith. In the, um, in the Old Testament, let me just go on quickly, quickly, if you just permit me, just go a little bit Old Testament here. In the Old Testament, there's a wonderful story. It's a story um, in uh, Exodus chapter 17, I think it is, in which the Amalekites attack Israel. The Amalekites attack Israel, and um, they keep doing this for a while, and then Moses, and then that's it. Moses, that's it. Let's make war against the Amalekites. Let's fight back. And so Moses... Um, gets Joshua to arrange the, the army, and then Moses goes on top of a high place. And he gets on top there, and he's with Aaron, and he's with Hor, and, and when he raises his hands, the Israelites are winning. And he holds them up, and they're winning. But Moses is flesh and blood, probably an old dude too. But everyone, his, his arms go down, and then they start losing. And then he gets, and they, they, he holds them up again. And they start winning. And he's an old dude, so they rotate the cuffs. They kind of get to him, so he has to go back down again. So he keeps doing this all of the time. And Aaron and Hord said, okay, we got this. And so what they do is they go either side of him, and they hold up his arms. And your Bibles are going to say that they held up his arms steadily. That's what your Bible says. But the Hebrew word here, emunah, it means faithfully. And it means consistently, all of the time. And that's the essence of faith. You do it consistently. You act correctly, consistently. This is our faith. This is what we need to be looking at. This is what we need to, as you look back in the year, think about times when, uh, where, when, where your faith kicked in. Those were the times that you were challenged. Those were the times that you were put into a situation that you didn't even, you couldn't even see the end of it. And yet you still were faithful, you were happy, you were encouraging, you sought to serve God in those situations. That's faith. That's faith in God, because you don't know how, but you know that he's going to do it. And you keep on doing it, you persevere, and you push through. So that's how we see Faith in our life, that's staying power. That's how we see it in our lives. But then what about doubts? What about doubts? Let me tell you something about doubts. Doubts are going to be there. Doubts are a shadow of faith. When you have faith, it will cast shadows of doubt. They are going to be there. Now, this is where people get confused. Doubts are not the problem. The problem are, problem, uh, problems arise. What are we going to do with the doubts? Are you going to act with them and throw in the towel? Or are you going to persist in faith? Please don't think that when a doubt comes into your mind, you have somehow failed, because you have not. 
the doubts will come. Of course they will come. You can guarantee it. But that's not a sign of your weakness. That's not a sign of failing. When Noah, do you think Noah spent months, how many times, do you, do you not think that Noah just thought, did I hear right? Did he actually ask me to build this? Those doubts came up. Think about Abraham. Genesis 17, 15. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? This is Abraham, the father of faith, doubting. Doubting. You think you're better than him? No, no. Doubts are going to come. Thoughts of failure are going to come. We're human, we're flesh and blood. Thoughts of maybe God isn't hearing you, they're going to come. They will come. The question is, what are you going to do with them? I had a, an amazing discussion. Yeah, there was a, a, I, I, I took a group out to Israel um, a year, two years ago, I can't remember, and there was a, a woman who was there and she was, she was talking about it. She'd lost her, her husband. And the church had been praying for her husband and he had cancer and they prayed and he recovered and then he went into relapse. A believing man, somebody who loved God and he died. He died and she had three children. And she was telling me how weak she felt the first Christmas, opening up presents, her husband wasn't there. And she screamed in front of her kids, why? Why? She screamed out in front of her kids, why, oh Lord, did you have to take him? And she said this was a moment of lack of faith. And I said, no. I said, this is the strongest faith. This is, this is real faith. Because in your despair, you cried out to a living God who you knew could hear you. She didn't cry to the sofa. She didn't cry to a Christmas tree. She didn't cry to, to a car. Because she knows that they can't help and they don't hear she cried out to a living God. Despite the doubts, she cried out to a living God. And I knew there was faith there. And as it happens, this lady goes on, and even within the Assemblies of God churches, she has run an organization to help women bereave with, uh, to cope with bereavement. That's faith. Because she carried on serving God through the doubts through the fears, through the worries, she carried on serving God. That is faith. Or better still, that is faithfulness. Continuation of that action. So this is, this is doubt that will come. When you are faced with doubt, my biggest word of advice to you is keep going. Keep serving. Keep doing, keep doing despite the pain. Keep doing despite the thoughts of hopelessness. Keep doing despite anything that the enemy says. Come to church, sing, open your mouth, give glory to God in the congregation. Keep doing when you have the doubts. But don't think that you're going to live a doubt-free life. But we can choose to live faithful lives. So that's what we need to do when the doubts come. And so now we come just to the final part about building our faith. Growing in faith. How do we grow in faith? Everybody wants to grow in faith. So I'm going to offer a couple of suggestions. First of all, I'm going to say one way we don't grow our faith. And this is something... And I pray to God I'm not talking to anyone in this con congregation now, but this is something which I was familiar with in, congregation, in congregations in England. Some people thought it was a great idea to grow their faith by chasing miracles. 
by chasing miracles, going from church to church, looking for miracles, looking for something amazing. And that was growing their faith. And let's not be fooled here. I love to see David Copperfield. I love to see him. Do you see after he made a, He made an airplane display one time. You see that? That was amazing, man. So I love to see it. We love to see these things. This isn't faith. This isn't faith. These aren't faith-building things. Miracles come. We give glory to God. We, we keep going on living faithful lives. But don't make this our life. Don't make this some kind of an idea that you're going to go pursuing these things to build your faith. It doesn't work like that. How do we build our faith? How do we grow in faith for the year to come? Faith is like a muscle that has to be exercised. Now I'm going to go to, um, and this is, I feel quite, I feel fine doing this. You know, last year if I did this, I would have felt bad, but I don't, I feel fine. If, if Pastor John could quote Bruce Lee, I'd quote anybody, okay? <laughs> so I quote David Goggins. He is this man who speaks about fitness, and he's a, he's a fitness freak, a body health um, fitness freak, and he gives this piece of advice to maintain fitness and strength. I almost don't want to share this. But it's golden. You ready? Do something that sucks every day. That's great advice right now. <laughs> Do something that sucks. What is he talking about? He's saying, with regards to fitness, muscle development, do something difficult that you don't normally do every day. It might be to walk up two flights of steps instead of taking the elevator. It might be walking to work. It might be eating a bowl full of Brussels sprouts. Maybe that's too far. But it's the idea, the idea is that you do something small each day because it has an accumulative effect on your body. And it works like that for the body, it works like that for the muscles and for your personal health and fitness. And so I would take that and transfer it into the realm of the spiritual. Do something that's difficult for you to do every day. Something small that's difficult for you to do. Reach out and do it every day to grow in your faith. It could be something very small. It could be having a morning devotion. It could be reading the Word. You don't normally do it. It could be putting down your phone and reading a, a scripture. Small thing like that. Something that you don't normally do. Something that might be difficult. If you're an introvert, it might be picking up the phone and calling someone. That's a really big deal. I'm going to say for me personally, huge deal. But do something like that which sucks for me, but it's a blessing to somebody else. It's a blessing for somebody else, and it's an action that I can say that I'm doing because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. So we do something. We, in, we include small things that suck each day for the sake of the kingdom, to grow our faith. Do something that sucks every day. That's how we grow. That's one thing we do. That's one way we exercise our faith and we grow in our faith. Something else we can do, which is really good, and this is something which it, we, we see here that Abraham did. Abraham had his eyes on something bigger. To exercise faith, focus on the big picture, not on the short term. When we focus on the short term, we are more likely to collapse and die. When Jesus was at Gethsemane, and I, wish, I, I really wish I could take you all there, I wish I could show you the place, the Garden of Gethsemane, and where it is in Jerusalem. Because it's in a place in Jerusalem where Jesus could have turned around, gone up 
down a hill and be gone. Very easy. Very easy. They would never have found him. But he didn't. He chose to go the other way. He chose to go the other way because he was thinking of the bigger picture. He was thinking of the glory of being back together with the Father. He was thinking about the great salvation that he could bring to mankind. He thought of the bigger picture and all of that and the pain which he was going to suffer of the cross, of the beating for the next 12 hours, 24 hours, all of that pales in comparison to what was going to come. To help build our faith, to help us continue to be faithful, we need to take a look at the bigger picture. We need to think in terms of treasures in heaven. We need to think in terms of a day when we're going to be out of these frail bodies that collapse and don't do what we want them to do all the time. We need to think of the new bodies we're going to receive in heaven. We need to think of the eternity. Eternity is a long time, by the way. We need to think of that and compare it to what we're going through now. Focus on the bigger picture to help us through, to help you through those difficult times. And the times that I know that, and I know that I, I look around and I know that many of you are going through those times. Think of the bigger picture. Think of how good it is going to be. And just for the final point about making through, and at this point I'd like to, uh, let me call up the musicians. The final thing we can do to help strengthen our faith is to pray for it. It's to pray for it personally, to say, Lord, this is hard. Lord, I see my family struggling. This is hard. Help me in my faith. Give me strength for faith. But more importantly, God has placed us in a community and he has given us support from each other. And we need to pray for each other that our faith remains strong. Very often when we hear of something bad happening, we hear of people going through things, we pray for it just to be over. And Lord knows, that I, I, I kind of like that. I, I don't want to go through anything bad. We just pray for it to be over. Can I add that praying in the will of God, can I just add one small tweak that we remember to pray that people's faith will stand strong during those times. And this is a prayer that you can pray for anybody. It's a prayer that as soon as you hear bad news, as soon as you hear of somebody struggling, pray that their faith would remain strong. Jesus saw something that happened to Simon and he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. To be like Jesus, we have to pray for each other. We share what's going on, but we pray for each other that we don't fail, that we don't quit that we don't throw in the towel and say this is too much, that we don't stop serving, but that our faith remains strong. So as we come to our closing song, and for some of you, some of us, it's gonna be the closing song for the year. Take some time to reflect. Where is your faith? Where was your faith this week? Where was my faith this week? Where was our faith this week, this year? What did it actually look like? And more importantly, begin to think and reflect on where your faith will be next year. 
what is it going to look like next year? Over the next 21 days, we're going to be thinking in terms of deeper. And I like to put a bit of a finer point on that. How can your faith be deeper next year? How can you grow in faith? As we sing this song before we close, think, meditate, dwell on these things. And again, as we sing it, the, the, the front will again, it will be open if you need somebody to pray with you that your faith might be strong. The prayer team is available and the prayer team is ready. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own. And for me, trust me, that's a big deal to say that. We cannot do this on our own. We need each other. We need the support of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now is the time. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my
as we close this part of the service the altars will remain open if, if somebody needs to if somebody hasn't finished doing business with the Lord then there is still time and I would just take this time as well to remind you that we're meeting again tonight um, but more importantly I think 21 days ahead of us when we can really focus on being faithful and practicing faithfulness whether that's prayer each day faithfully doing it it's an opportunity to practice, to exercise our faith. So keep that in mind and I just pray and have a plan and, and 
be proactive at the beginning of this year to come. Let me pray us out. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that was with us in the year that has gone by May that love, may that comfort, may that joy go with us in the year that is to come as well. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, Faith Online, we are so thankful once again that you made a decision to join with us today. Now, if you made a decision to follow Jesus and are wondering, what do I do next? Please be sure to click the Next Steps link below. Now, if you're having trouble getting to us in person because of life circumstances and would welcome a visit from our care team, would you be sure to fill out the electronic Connect card by clicking the link below? Finally, if God's been using this ministry as a blessing in your life, we would love if you would consider doing three things. Number one, subscribe to this channel. Uh, number two, share this link with someone else. And finally, number three, uh, consider supporting this ministry by praying for us, by getting involved, and by giving financially as God would lead you. Now, until next time, remember, living for Jesus won't always be easy, but it will always be worth it.